welcome to the 17th episode of the fifth season of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Tuesday the 9th of October and in this episode we're going to hear Tony interview Mark Shuttleworth mm-hmm. and interview the people behind Nikki and the robots. We will of course cover the latest news, events, bit about Ubuntu, tomorrow's technology today and go over your feedback. If you're listening live you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in the IRC channel. I'm Alan and joining me tonight are Mark. Hello. Laura. Hello. And Tony. Hello. <laughs> Mix it up a bit there. How is everyone? That Good. doesn't work as a joke. <laughs> no, it doesn't no. really, does it? Tony, what have you been up to? Uh, I went to Skycon at the weekend. Oh, really? Yes. Where's oh, that really? Then? It's in, well, it was in Ireland, Limerick in Ireland. And uh, what is it? It's a conference run by the Computer Society at the University of Limerick. Oh. And uh, they have people come along and talk and they invited me along because they have good taste, and uh, I gave a talk, and there were lots of other people there, um, a lot of undergraduates from the university, but also some people from elsewhere around Ireland come along for it. Um, yeah, it was good fun, and uh, very interesting as well. Did cool. you get to attend many talks? Yes, many more than I do at OG Camps. <laughs> I think all of the OG Camps combined, um, I think I went to more talks in one weekend. Um, yes. I saw a couple of photos posted online, and both mm. of them were you holding a cocktail or a beer or something. <laughs> <laughs> that might not be entirely representative of what I did. <laughs> I also showed lots of photographs of you. Oh, what? yeah, I really? saw that. Yes, you tweeted my... those too. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, Laura Tchaikovsky was, t- was tweeting those uh, in my talk. But yes, uh, I had a... Had fun? Cocktail. Yes, very much so. Awesome. Good fun. And you'll hear content from that over the next couple of episodes. So. Oh, good. Keep listening. <coughs> Super. So, Laura, how about yourself? What have you been up to? I got a weekend on my own. Oh, so of course. <laughs> you, cho- you chose not to go with Tony to uh, yeah, Skycom. I didn't have to get off. I didn't have to get dressed. <laughs> okay. Good <maybe>. eat. <laughs> Played Nikki and the Robots. Ah, excellent. Yeah. Yeah, more about Nikki and the Robots a bit later. Indeed. We're yeah. sounding very coordinated this evening. It does. Yeah. Sounds like this was kind of planned and everything. Awesome. Mm. Mark. I've been on holiday. Oh. Where did you go? Portugal. Was it nice? Yeah, it was very sunny. You haven't got much of a tan. No. Not as much as I had last time. <laughs> yeah. David Dickinson. <laughs> um, yeah, but I did see Ubuntu in the wild. Oh, really? The Faro what? Airport in Portugal oh. have these sort of like information kiosk first aid point oh, things. Oh, was it crashed? <laughs> That's how I knew. Yeah. <laughs> well, one, when we were going there, it was like the middle of the night, so obviously no one was doing anything about it, but I, there was one sat on the grub bootloader menu. Oh, no. <laughs> no. But then, yeah, the rest of the time they were all working. But yeah, mm. that was just sat there waiting for someone to press enter. Yeah, it's going to bite us, isn't it? One, you know, we keep going around taking photos. Well, I do of uh, blue screens, blue screens at airports, and uh, and you know, people are just going to mm. start sending me Ubuntu crash dialogues on covering up stuff. Oh well, that just shows that it's being more widely used. <laughs> that could yes. only be a good thing. Yes, I guess. What about you, Alan? Um, I got sick of my uh, micro server being about eight inches from my head on my desk <laughs> and making a lot of noise. Uh, so I moved it somewhere else. And mm-hmm. uh, in the Exciting. process, well, kind of. Uh, in the process, um, I re enabled my current cost. Oh. So um, my graphs that have been offline for over a oh, year, yeah. I, uh, I've re enabled. And um, yeah, that all works quite nicely. On my, I've got it plugged into the micro server. So it's all uploading nice, pretty graphs showing my uh, usage and. Yeah, when I tweeted it, people were saying, oh, did you turn the kettle on at 20 past eight? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, yes, my yes. graphs, yes. <laughs> yes. You get that a lot, don't you, Tony? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, let's get on with the show. So, at the weekend, I was at Skycon, as I believe I just mentioned, and I sat down with one Mr. Mark Shuttleworth, the uh, founder of Ubuntu and Canonical, the self-appointed benevolent dictator for life, Um, and we sat down next to a quite noisy fridge. Um, <laughs> what, which, what can you find a toilet to stand in? <laughs> yeah. A train. Or... He, has, he has some standards, of course. You know. <laughs> um, so yes. So with bearing that in mind, uh, we will now play you the uh, the interview I recorded with Mark. I'm here at Skycom with Mark Shuttleworth. Hey, doing, Mark? Groovy. Hi. So you've been talking about Ubuntu and the latest things that are coming up, and cloud and design and things like that. Um, one of the things that struck me was that 
design is where the focus has been for Ubuntu for the desktop for the last two, three years at least. Um, where do you think it's going next? When are we going to start to see Ubuntu on TVs and phones and tablets? Well, think of the, think of the magnitude of the shift that we're making, right? We're going from a, a, um, uh, a very simple focus on um, one use case to having to accommodate these very diverse ways of using services and computing. Um, and that's a big transition with a small team. So it, it does take time. But I, I really think the pieces are coming together. Um, uh, we showed how Unity fits onto a TV, and, and I think that explained to people some of the choices that were made in the, in the creation of Unity. And as the phone and tablet interfaces fall into place, I think people will realize that this is a unique family of interfaces that were designed from the start to be a family, um, each of them... Um, uh, efficient for their particular kind of interaction, but still telling one story in 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 in, in one language. Um, uh, we've had we we get fantastic um, engagement from uh, members of the community who are passionate about those individual pieces. Um, but I think for the vast majority, you know, um, uh, you know, when they see a big new release. They may be unaware of the number of small things that had to be done to to make that possible. One of the challenges, if you if you have an interface like Unity, which is a, a consistent experience across a number of different interfaces, is the applications that sit alongside it. How much influence, how much work and effort can you realistically put in to those applications to make sure that that level of the, uh, sure. that part of the experience is consistent? Sure. Well, we certainly can't do it all. You know, I mean, I, we certainly don't have a vision of saying, "Well, we're going to sit and create, you know, all of the apps for all of the the form factors." What we what we what we hope to do is to enable, um, and in you know, it's up to the open source community whether they step up. Um, and uh, you know, historically, I think what we can what we can infer from the past is that some people will, and some people vocally won't. <laughs> you know, so so what we're saying is, you know, we're, we're we're setting out to do something that nobody else has set out to do to create this um, responsive interface across all of these form factors. That creates opportunities for people who want to deliver their app or their experience across this diversity. Some people will say that's just a ridiculous idea, and they're not going to touch it with a barge pole. And um, others will sit down thoughtfully and and do amazing things. And um, uh, I th I'm, you know, I think we'll have enough of the latter to to build a cohesive, coherent experience across all of those platforms. Do you think that's been a problem with the Linux desktop in the past? Is that people have been essentially trying to to use the same applications, perhaps just with their own slight twist in their distros? Uh, but now we're looking and uh, saying. We need everybody to step up to the game to, to use this uh, this model for Unity, um, but without without affecting the work they're doing to enable their applications to be used in other distributions. Is it uh, oh, a fragmentation? Might be the wrong word, but is that a, a diversity of effort that's not sustainable? Maybe. I think I think people should do what they want to do. You know what I mean? Like people should have fun and do what they want to do. Um, all we're saying is that we're creating something that's never existed before. And we're doing it all as open source and giving it all away. That's a pretty incredible thing. And, um, uh, it, you know, the odd person who steps up and gets grumpy because we're creating something that's never existed before and giving it all away and doing it all as an open source, I think they just look grumpy, you know what I mean? Um, at least to, to my eyes. <laughs> um, uh, but that's not really the point. The point is that um, there's going to be an opportunity to deliver open source apps to all of these profoundly important kinds of personal computing. Um, and I hope people will grab that with both hands and do fantastic stuff with it. Some will, and it doesn't take that many. You know, It just takes a couple of bright people to do cool stuff. Speaking of grumpy people, there have been quite a few on the internet in the last week or two um, talking about the, uh, the Amazon shopping uh, search or the context search. Each release of Ubuntu for the last couple of years seems to have had something that's landed not long before the release that's caused people to get upset. Is that a problem? 
does does that distract from perhaps the good changes and uh, sorry, not not that those changes are bad changes, but does it distract from all the positives that are coming in a release of Ubuntu? Um, we're a little torn between the mantra of release early and often, and oh my God, there are bugs, right? Mm. So so you know, on the one hand, we'll have smart people saying you know you should have released this earlier, and other people saying you, you know you shouldn't have released this, you shouldn't have put this in the release. Um, there are those are always tough decisions. Um, uh, there is a certain audience that wants every release of Ubuntu to be an LTS maintained for 20 years, you know, you know, with perfect security support for free. Well, that's just not going to happen. You know, we're constantly um, trying to find the balance between, you know, what users need, the need for change, and the fact that the rest of the world is changing around us as well. A lot of the change, you know, is stuff that we inherit from um, the open source community at large. Um, I think the fact that people get upset about Ubuntu is more a reflection of the fact that um, Ubuntu is hugely widely used and people care about it and love it and depend on it and so any sort of change is, is unsettling um, it's certainly true that we've not it's certainly true that occasionally we screw up that's true of anybody it's also true that if you look at all of the change that's happened over the last four years, many of which have been changes that you know caused the sky to fall in and the world to end for, for the blogosphere, um, looking back at those changes um, on balance, I think they've all been phenomenally good. Um, try and use Ubuntu 804. Mm. You know, that's two LTSs ago. Uh, it's like a completely different world, right? And more than that, if you look at the change that's been driven in the broader open source ecosystem, we've been leading that. We led the creation of new interfaces. Um, nobody was reinventing the interface before we went out and did it. Um, uh, there is a natural human sort of forking and fragmentation that goes on. The Red Hat guys couldn't possibly use something from Canonical, um, and so they had to have their own one. Um, and we had to be the bad guys. But I really don't care about all of that. What I care about is that it's moving in a positive direction. We're leading that we're doing it with integrity and and professionally and and we fix the mistakes that we make um, so what are you asking are you asking that the fact that stuff lands late in the cycle is is problematic well well it, it, it seems problematic for some people but they are the people who are using the development version anyway Right, exactly. And so these are folk who would be equally upset if we said, well, we're not going to put out a release. We're just, you can just stay, the, stay on the LTS. And they would say, oh, this is terrible. I'm going to Arch. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> you know, so, so that's that. Yeah. How much change is acceptable for people? Uh, Unity is quite different from the old GNOME. Yeah. And people have had to learn how to use it. And generally, people have done and they've accepted the change and they moved on. How do you judge whether uh, a change is too much would you ever look at not making a huge amount of change in release and maybe spreading over a few releases just because of the uh, this the disruption uh, that it might cause people um well we could do some things for example we could have put unity into you know as a side option um the challenge is that you you know you we're only going to create this change in the world if we lead it with conviction. Right? This is a major change in the world. I mean, just think about this. this you're Microsoft, you've got Apple, you've got Google, and you've got us. Right? None of the other ones really matter. Right? Uh, <laughs> Red Hat, the CEO has said publicly he just doesn't care about the desktop. So GNOME isn't going to do what we need. If you, if you actually want a platform that really will create change, not just for you, but for real change, right? Someone's going to have to lead that. So that's us. And so that's what we're going to do. And so if, if you know, that, that's not going to work for everybody, but then maybe they just shouldn't use the platform. Here's our commitment. You know, we, we, we hire the best people we can. We, we attract the best people in the community we can. We have the most open community processes. There's more independent participation in Unity design than in, in, in um, uh, any other desktop environment. Um, there's more open participation in, in the code. Um, uh, uh, 
it's a great place to be and we're creating the future so I and uh, Ubuntu has been a project that you've been working on for 10 years uh, it, does it still appeal does it still excite you in the morning it excites me if I believe we can actually change the world otherwise it's a an exhausting crazy you know very difficult impossible task but the possibility that we can change the world is what makes me do it so I won't you know you can imagine that I'm not particularly um, uh, inclined to apologize for leading that change right that's why we do it right we genuinely believe that this can be a better platform but it wasn't going to be a better platform if we kept going too it just wasn't yeah. <laughs> that that had had its own 10 years its own decade to to fail right so somebody had to do something different it was you know fish or cut bait go big or go home uh, and i'm pretty proud of what we've done as you say people have come around to unity um, you know, we now get told not to make more changes to Unity because it's perfect. How could you have changed it? <laughs> Which is ironic in its own way. Um, uh, but I think, I think as the vision unfolds, as people start to get to use it on different form factors, that, you know, we'll build a really strong community. Is Ubuntu now where you thought it would be when you started out 10, 10 years ago or so? Um, that's, that's a very difficult question to answer because clearly it's it's achieved things that I might have thought were impossible at the time. You know, that, that, that Dell is going to ship a huge number of PCs with Ubuntu globally next year is fantastic. HP, Lenovo, all doing the same. That's kind of fantastic. At the same time, there are still big challenges, right? Big uh, unanswered questions. Um, what's going to happen with Android and Chrome OS? What's going to happen with um, uh, the new Win 8 and, and Win Phone? Um, what is the real role of Ubuntu in the cloud and, and, and so on. There's still some sort of big open questions, big problems to solve. Um, uh, it's very straightforward. I, I, I think it's the best platform around. I think we have the most amazing community working with us. Um, and I think we have our heart and, and gaze firmly set on occupying the future. Um, that's what we're going to do. And that sounds like an excellent note on which to wrap up. So thank you very much indeed for taking the time to talk to me. Sure. It's great to meet you. Cheers. And now it's time for the news. Uh, Samsung have released F2FS, a new file system des uh, designed specifically for use on solid state flash memory. It's easy for you to say. <laughs> yeah. do, does it do things like um, not writing the same sectors again? Trim. Or... Sorry? Trim support. That's what that is. Okay, good. Yeah. Does it do that? I guess it must do, and yeah. Cool. Yes. And an additional PAT set has been submitted to the Linux kernel to add support for the file system. Good old PAT set. Patch set. Oh. <laughs> so that means that it'll be in things like Android for Samsung phones, etc. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, that makes sense. sense. Oh, you <laughs> <laughs> You've got to go a long way to impress Tony with the file system, I'm <laughs> sure. Version 1.0 of Open Web OS, the embedded OS originally seen on the Palm Pre smartphone, has been released. The OS can currently be run on Open Embedded Emulator and has support for the Enyo framework for writing cross-platform JavaScript apps, future plans including porting to other devices and adding open source media components. So... It's not dead. No, no. Excellent. Yeah. Sound to see it's kind of still, <laughs> yeah, still alive and well, not shipping, not shipping on any devices. It, it has the community's full support. Excellent. Well, that'll get it a long way. We know what, how well that works. <laughs> what was the one uh, that Hugo the... had? Sorry, Hugo. Yeah, that original one. No, he had an N nine hundred, which is mm. running no. Migo, maybe. No. no, way back the first mobile phone. Hugo's first mobile phone. No, the first mobile phone. For Linux that had Linux on it. Oh, so uh, it was, actually, it was a Motorola. Oh, okay. I know what you're talking about. The yes. Neo uh, 1973. Open Moco. Open Moco. Open Moco that That's the one. The one where you always <laughs> go in the gag. down in Acapulco. Can it, can it make phone calls yet? No. <laughs> <laughs> actually, there's, they're, they're, that phone, um, a company has made a hardware upgrade kit. So if you have that phone, you can take it all to bits <laughs> and put, put, put them away put, in put, <laughs> <laughs> Go to the shops and buy a different phone. Yes. 
Excellent. Microsoft have submitted an unusual DMCA takedown request requiring Google to remove certain URLs from its index due to copyright infringement. Among the URLs that allegedly infringe Microsoft's copyright are a collection of pages from sites including the BBC and Wikipedia, all relating to the number 45. <laughs> this would be a lot more fun if it was 42. Yeah. People yeah. wouldn't take it anywhere near as seriously if it was 42. And is it, Indeed. Is it literally got to have 45 in the URL or is no. it like no, a combination it's, no, it's of stuff multiply? That, so a lot of, the, a lot of the URLs are like sort of dodgy looking websites, but then it's got like s- stuff about like people who are 45 years old and <laughs> something that happened like the 45th person to take the Olympic torch oh, no. and all yeah. sorts of other like references to the number 45. So this, this would have been some automated thing. Yeah. Which for some reason, as well as these websites apparently distributing software, picked up completely innocuous websites all relating to this number. Harmless mistake. Yeah. Anyone could do it. <laughs> <laughs> three missing children's charities... Well, three missing children's charities have supported the launch of notfound.org, a way for websites to make good use of their 404 not found pages by displaying information about missing children. Oh, okay. How does it work? Uh, you basically put a little bit of code in your 404 page and it goes to get a... Uh, if, if someone... This is assuming your website has a 404 page and that's very yeah. easy to set up on... In, in fact, it's easy on most like Drupal and WordPress things. Mm. It's it done, it for, done you. for you. Yeah. If not, you know, Apache and so-and-so have a, um, a way to do it. Mm. But uh, if someone ever goes to a broken URL on your site and ends up at a 404... Uh, it loads an image uh, and some content from this notfound.org, shows a picture of um, a missing person and some details about where they were seen and contact details for how you can get hold of the the charities involved. That's a really good idea. Yeah, Yeah. I put it on my website when I heard about it. Oh, cool. Because I thought, well, the most impressive thing I've ever had as a 404 page was a game of Yahtzee, (laughs) (laughs) which was quite good fun. But but, it's not quite as socially worthy. ultimately pointless, yeah. Mm. I have to see how well this works out and how many people adopt it. It's a good idea. Mm. Finnish startup Jolla Limited have announced the upcoming release of a new smartphone running the open source Migo operating system recently abandoned by Nokia. Mm. Jolla hopes to compete with a unique interface which is well patented and doesn't copy anybody, according to the Jolla chief executive. Well, that's great news, isn't it? <laughs> Someone else on the on the landscape having something well patented. Yes. Mm. Things can only go well there, can't they? Yeah, it's the top of a list of my priorities. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind a phone that can actually make phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, the Humble Bundle is back with an ebook bundle uh, sporting Ooh. a whole bunch of books. <laughs> There's a ghost <laughs> in e form uh, that you can pay what you want for. Yes. Excellent. What books? It's a graphic novel by Neil Gaiman. Oh. Is that one of the ones you have to pay over the average to get? Yes. And there's uh, a book by Cory Doctorow and mm. a few other less well-known <laughs> authors. <laughs> but it's awesome. all yeah, it's all DRM free. Pay what you want in the same way that the um, the humble games bundles. So you can get yeah. them in like ebook or Mobi or PDF or yes. whatever. So now, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> all right. yeah. Yeah. But you've just awesome. bought it, Laura. Yes. Excellent. Oh, let us know how it works out. Yeah. <laughs> And we have some events. Ooh. Um, I haven't read the first one. <laughs> Something at lanyard.com. <laughs> yes, it's a hack day at uh, South Hackton. Oh, oh right. Oh, cool. uh, yeah, Excellent. now you're interested. <laughs> now, now you know that it's actually nearby. Uh, yes, they're having a South Hackton hack day on the 14th of October from 10.30 until 4.30. Uh, it's in Southampton in the UK at the 29th Southampton Scout Group building brilliant yes and the other event is one that actually hasn't happened and isn't planned yet but is in embryonic stage um i was having a chat with um laura tchaikovsky uh yesterday and today about uh, something she wanted to set up called hack and talk um and the idea is that there's a um an event um uh, maybe three or four times a year one day only on each of those dates right um and you go along and you talk about stuff and you hack on stuff maybe two tracks no keynotes no huge amounts of technology all done back to basics with post-it notes so you just get in yeah, there and do hacking uh listen to interesting people talk about cool technology and uh, at the moment she's looking for a venue to hold her first hack and talk brilliant um and you can get in contact with laura at uh 
Twitter at Hack and Talk, or you can join the uh, IRC channel on the Freedom Network, Hack and Talk, as well. <laughs> and the website is hackntalk.org. <laughs> now I'm, yeah, the, the name sounded great yesterday when we came up with it, but right. <laughs> now I'm hoping to read it out. Hack and Talk. I it's so. exactly what you think. Hackandtalk.org. I hope they will be serving fish and mm, chips. Hack <laughs> <laughs> mm, Talk. Uh, right, is that it for the events? Yes. Yes. Welcome to Tomorrow's Technology Today. I'm Douglas Austin Cambridge. Good day to all our listeners wherever you are around the British Empire, or indeed Bondi Beach, where I believe the colonial commoners ride the waves on a sort of ironing board. A surfboard, Douglas. Uh, that will be our delightful co-host, Miss Deirdre Morris Oxford. Good day, Deirdre. Good day, Douglas. I see the bruises have almost gone from last week. How is your eye? Fine. And your nose? Fine. And your split lip? Fine. Can we get on with this week's show? Actually, we've had several requests to listen again to your altercation in last week's show with Mr. Declan Thicket. Discussion, Deirdre. Altercation, Douglas. Uh, look, he started it. Mr. Declan Thicket certainly finished it. He caught me unawares. What was it you said about his idea for the self-service shop? Poppycock? Well, really, it is the most preposterous idea. A self-service, indeed. There's thousands of shop assistants would be put out of work under such a scheme. I'd have thought you'd be dead against it as you're some sort of socialist. Better than a national socialist, Douglas. It will never catch on at Fortnum and Mason's, I can tell you. Putting your own provisions through an electronic till. Next, you'll have us carrying the bags home ourselves. It really is a scheme too far. Just imagine the thousands of shop girls who could get a proper education and perform intellectual jobs. Thinking jobs. Thinking up absurd shopping schemes like Mr. Declan Thicket. How is the bruising on your... And now we've spent so much time recapping last week's show, we don't have time for this week's inventions. Gosh and indeed, darn it, Deirdre. That's all for tomorrow's technology today. Total pip and God save the kid. So on the line, we have Zunka and Ivan from Joyride Labs. Hello, guys. How are you? Hi, we're fine. We're Thank fine. you. Whereabouts in the world are, are we calling you from? No, that's uh, not We're right. calling from <laughs> Berlin in Germany. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Zunka's in the kitchen and I'm in his room. <laughs> that was brilliant. That was very, very precise. Oh, hang on. You're both in the same location. Yeah, yeah. but... We created an echo by using two phones, and we weren't sure we were using one phone. <laughs> Brilliant. So, Brilliant. I'm so glad, dedication. You, so glad you tested this stuff out. Thank you very much. <laughs> so the reason why I wanted to talk to you is because um, I found out via OMG Ubuntu that there was this cool game called Nikki and the Robots, and um, I downloaded it and had a play with it, and um, I paid for some um, additional content, and you guys made it. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, uh, tell us a bit about where you started. What, what, what got you started with Nikki and the Robots? Uh, Zunke, will you well, go ahead? Yeah, I started uh, creating the game with uh, Florian Hofer, a friend of mine. And uh, he's a game enthusiast, as, as I am too. And um, we thought it would be great to do a, a game together. And we were both in, in places in our lives where we... we uh, thought it would be great to to just try to become game developers. <laughs> so we just started, and it uh, was quite interesting. And it took uh, way longer than we anticipated, but uh, I'm I'm very glad that it, that we did it. How long from start to finish? So, I mean, would you say it was finished now? You know, how long from start Have you to been finish? Working yeah. yeah. Uh, we've been working on it for three years, not full-time, but wow. uh, wow. it has been a lot of work, yeah. 
Has, has it been a part-time thing or full-time, you know, doing your day job? No, we, we both had to uh, had to do other things as well. Okay. Uh, to earn some money. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. So one of the interesting things is the, the model under which you've, you've released um, Nikki and the Robots. It's the game engine is, is open source, am I right? And then you can pay for additional content. Can you tell us how you selected that model and um, whether it's working out well for you? So I uh, joined the, pro the, the project like a year or w one and a half ago. And one of the things that got me interested was that it is open source. Um, and, um, so, and they happened to be in the same city in which I lived, so I contacted them and talked to them a bit about business because it didn't seem very clear how exactly they were planning to do it. And it was, uh, back then, the Humble Indie Bundle was rather new, mm -hmm. and I was very interested in that and talked about, them, about uh, the Humble Indie Bundle model with them. And, uh, and Zunke and Florian were quite interested. I don't know if, if you had considered such a model before already, I think we we were when when Ivan joined the team we were just in the process of of getting uh, the model in, in in the way it, it is now um, so we were already talking about these ideas and um, I, th I think my my main uh, motivation for it is that uh, I think it's it's rather absurd to to um, prevent people from from uh, from consuming your your products mm -hmm. by by Digital rights management or, or the like. Um, so we, we, I, I thought it would be cool to have some model like this, and then we, we just needed to figure out how to still make money off it, and we decided on on this model that the game itself, the game engine, and and the basic graphics uh, and the level editor are all open source and free, and you have to pay for additional content. Because um, I'm a bit of a, a licensed geek, am I right in thinking that the fact it's it's lesser GPL, isn't it? The game, yeah. the game engine is that um, like necessary in your business model? In that then you can have the closed source levels um, which you can sell, or is there another reason for it being LGPL? Um, well, I think in the in the beginning there was the idea that there might be some code. Uh, included in the in the story episodes, mm -hmm. which would not be open open sourced. So to link that together with with uh, the game engine would that that would uh, for, for that to work you you would need uh, the, the lesser uh, GPL. Yeah, but I think it's not necessary uh, the way it is now. Okay, because there's there's no code included in the, in the story episode. Oh, right it's now. just um, assets. The, yeah, we yeah. we decided that we wanted to put uh, all the code under under an open source right. license. So cool. It's all in the, in the and speaking of the code, part. it's am I right in saying it's written in Haskell? What? Well, yes. That's. I, I think I've only ever come across one other thing on my <laughs> machine that I've ever known was written in Haskell. What What made you choose that? Which Which, which was that? Uh, it was a podcast downloader called HPodder. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. See, and nobody's heard of it. <laughs> what, what made you choose Haskell, and uh, what, what does that what does that give you that the other languages you could have chosen didn't? Um, well, I, I'm the programmer, and I'm an, I'm a Haskell enthusiast, and I just couldn't imagine having having fun writing using another language <laughs> for such a big project. I know the feeling. Um, yeah, I mean, if if you you're a programmer. I am. I'm yeah. not. So you know that 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 the language is pretty important to mm. the way you think and the way you solve problems. And uh, um, yeah, it's it's really my taste. In, in yeah, that. and suppose uh, I suppose it has all of the sort of the bindings for all of the bits that you need to make games as well already there. Um, well, the 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 language community is not as big as as for other languages, obviously, but um, they are very very great. Um, there's a very great foreign function interface, so you can create your own bindings right. in a kind of nice way. Mm -hmm. So we, for example, we created bindings for Qt for the things we needed from Qt. Oh right, wow. To to use the the, the graphics yeah. layer of Qt, and that turned out 
much less painful than I thought. <laughs> so if, you, if you're developing in Haskell and you're using Qt and there's also a bunch of assets that go along with the game, did you create those yourselves or did you commission them from somewhere else and the, the music and how did, how did that all come together? Mm, well, for the, for the graphics part, it was mainly Florian, mm -hmm. who... Uh, who is a, is a graphic designer and uh, did all the the, the pixely graphics, and uh, the music took a took a long time. But we um, asked uh, C. Error, uh, um, an artist from from the Netherlands, who does eight bit music, and we asked him if we we could use his music. You can also buy his music for pay what you want if you. Oh really? Yeah, it's really yeah. good. Oh cool. Yeah. It, it's it's interesting. So his that that album that you're using in the game is that did that already exist or did you commission that or you just you know just went to him because you liked his music and it fit the 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 start of the game. Yeah, it it it, it did exist before we we put it in the game. It's called Rainbow Parade. Right. It's really and, cute. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we, we thought it really, really well. fit and yeah. It, yeah, it was strange when I first put it in the game. I was really surprised how, how the character changed of the game mm -hmm. when there's suddenly music and then I needed some, some days to get accustomed to the... To the <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. talking of character, the, the character Nikki, uh, there's a very distinct um, style to Nikki and the Robots, the, the kind of pixel art. It's, it's, it's lovely to look at. And Nikki, him or herself... I, I can't quite tell. It's someone in a cat outfit by the look of it. How did that come <laughs> about? It's just odd. <laughs> <laughs> it's odd, but it's very cute. Yeah. Um, how did that come about? Yeah. Why? <laughs> uh, well, thanks uh, for, for saying that. Um, <laughs> Ivan, are you still there? Yeah, but I, but I think you should cover that as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, it's actually a cat. Uh, a half a cat and half a ninja costume. Uh, ah, okay. Ah, like what I have. That's that's <laughs> the idea. Um, we we thought we we should we, we wanted the game to be a bit um, to have like a a, a childlike feeling mm. to it. <laughs> right. So we wanted we, we we didn't want to explicitly say that these characters are children, and and I don't think that. I don't think of them as children, but um, we wanted to have all the game to have more. For example, the the, the robots have more a, like a, a toy-like feel. Yeah, yeah. They do. I think yeah. Yeah, that that's what we are aiming for. And we thought it would be cool to have a, a character that is a, looks a bit like a child and has has is, has a costume to make it to make it a bit to to, to, to lighten up, if you will. Mm, right. And so, 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 so the theme was to yeah. make it more accessible to, to children as well, right? Right, and yeah. I, I have to say, when I'm when I'm playing the game, my two kids, one's five, uh, one's six, and one's nine, and uh, they they just love watching me play the game. They get frustrated themselves when they play it because yeah, they die all the time, but <laughs> <laughs> but they just they just you know come running into the room when they hear the music going. And uh, just stand there and uh, and watch me playing. It's it's really very lovely. So, as it has, would you have how long have you had um, the um, pay what you like scheme going? Uh, are you going to keep that going, or is it uh, has it got a, a an end date? So I think we started on uh, September the seventeenth. Mm -hmm. Selling it from Um Zunke programmed the website himself, also in Haskell, and it's also open source. <laughs> oh, wow. And Excellent. So we first said, what, we'll do it for one week, then we extended it, and we extended it, and then we last said that we will just keep going at it until we find a good reason to stop selling it, pay what you want, cool. which um, might be something like getting into Steam or selling it on other portals. Mm -hmm. But we haven't um, really worked on that yet. 
So there's a, there's a it's got a very similar kind of feel the um, the pay what you like interface. It's very similar th- a feel to the humble bundle with the you know the little oh, yeah. pie chart and graphs. They and, are, uh, they are absolutely our main inspiration. Oh, I thought you were going to say and they ripped you off completely. <laughs> 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 the, um, and it, it says here statistics based on 836 purchases and alternative purchase, purchase methods are available. Was that important to you to have things like Bitcoin and other ways for people to pay? So, well, we wanted just to include these options because it seemed to be rather easy to do. Um, we had only very few Bitcoin payments, mm-hmm. and nobody tried to make a video to to trade it for a game yet. Oh, but, that, that was uh, one of the that's one of the payment options. How does that work? Yeah, so you uh, find a person and let them play the basic game, and film them and film the game, and then send the video to to us so we can like look how the person reacts the game oh, but right. maybe maybe our requirements are a bit too complicated I am, so nobody yet i'm totally to doing that with my six-year-old son yeah he would love that <laughs> <laughs> you can see him punching the keyboard when he dies <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um you asked if why haskell earlier and so as the newest member of the free-headed group i think um that the philosophy of this project in part, was doing something that you you yourself would love, and and Zunke obviously loves Haskell, mm. so that's what he used. And uh, Florian definitely loves the style he created. And during development, we often would uh, take a step back and just so test the game and comment to each other, "Hey, this is a pretty good game, <laughs> actually." It's nice, to, uh, nice to have that that that, that uh, reaction to something you've created. Mm. Did it, have you had? Uh, I mean, you've said it's open source, and I can see I've downloaded and had a look at it myself. Have you had any contributions directly in terms of code? Um, not to the game itself. I think there were certainly some some upstream uh, changes to some projects. Is it something you're actively looking for, or are you more interested in people creating levels for the game? We are definitely um, interested in more levels, but mm. um, we also currently are a bit on hold regarding code development. So we might uh, ask the community for contribution re- for two features which are quite well defined. We, we want gamepad support and a language so le- other language support for languages other than English. Oh, right. But we we haven't worked a way out yet how to communicate to the community that they could contribute that, which is also one of the things that I, I take from this project that the open source part might we should we could have communicated it better, perhaps hmm. maybe made it more obvious how to contribute yeah. as a coder. Right. I mean, I, I didn't yeah. even know about it until after it had come out and, you know, it was already, you know, for want of a better word, finished. Um, not that I would yeah, have well, necessarily actually, been able to... Go on. So it's not finished. It's the first episode, which is done. Right. Mm. But uh, we are on hold with the future episodes currently still marketing the first one. Right. Mm-hmm. So would you would you see your next steps as um, further development of Nikki and the robot's characters in other games or um, further development within this game or moving on to something completely different? Uh, well, I think that depends well, a bit on... Yeah. Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, that you, you, depends a lot on, on, on how much money we raise with, with this first episode. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so if it's, if it's going to go up, Further, then we we will have the, the resources to just work on a second episode. And if not, we we will just you know do different projects. I think all the, all of us. Right. So if people do want to get involved, or indeed they want to buy the the levels and uh, and have a play, uh, what's the best place for them to go? So currently, we sell the game only on our website. Mm-hmm. which is uh, joyridelabs.de or buy.joyridelabs.de. Cool. And it uses PayPal and Bitcoin and this video-making 
option. I just had a look at that. It looks really cool idea. <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. It's very innovative. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Uh, it's been very interesting. Well, and thanks for having us. Thank no you. problem at all. And uh, good luck with uh, future developments. Thank you. And now it's time for a tiny little little, little bit about Ubuntu. Yeah, it's pretty much insignificant, really. I don't think anyone will notice. No. <laughs> so Canonical... Should we mention it? Yes. <laughs> it starts Canonical. Um, Canonical's announced that a new screen will be added to the desktop download process to allow people to make financial contributions to the Ubuntu project. Uh-oh, Ooh. she said money. Ooh, right. I don't think I did. It's a contribution. <laughs> so, how are Canonical forcing people to pay for a, a, a Ubuntu? <laughs> they don't this let you press the free. button. Yes. yes. Right. Grab. Okay. So, what happens now? What's the new user experience? It's like, a, well, you say um, download Ubuntu, right. and then you say download the desktop CD, and then mm. you say download the 32 bit version, and it right. pops up a screen a bit like the Humble Bundle screen yes. with some sliders on saying, Okay. Contribute some money to Ubuntu if you want. Right. And you can put a slider up to say, contribute some money to making the desktop better, contribute some money to supporting um, uh, Kubuntu and Lubuntu and things like okay. that, or contribute some more money towards games. Or you can say, no, just download it. Right. So this isn't a compulsory tax on <laughs> Ubuntu users. <laughs> no. That's not what I'd call it. Okay. No. But it's a, a contribution. Cool. John does ask. Uh, John blogged about this, and in one of the various comments at the bottom, one of his questions to one of the commenters is, "So if we made the button look less like a link, oh, would you like it better?" Yeah. The, if you if you want to pay some money, there's a button that says contribute. Right. Otherwise, there's a link next to the button that says take no take me to the yeah. so I can, so the button stands out to you i but can the link see doesn't. why yeah i can mm. see why people get funny about that because when you go to something like a, a you know on the windows platform it's notorious when you go to a website that's like you know downloading a free antivirus software yeah there'll be a big shiny button that says pay for the full version and then a tiny little link next to it that says oh you can get the free version if you really want to <laughs> yeah. but we'd rather you didn't um so I can see why think, yeah, there's a there's a it looks like that kind of thing that looks, you know, um like we're really trying to encourage you to give us some money. Well, yeah. Which isn't unreasonable, I don't no. think. <laughs> yes. And uh, in fact loads of people in the past have said to us directly and you know, to me individually, have said, Oh, how can I give some money, you know, to a yeah. Well yeah, the the canonical okay. blog says that the reason they've done it is because people have asked them about it. It did not right. but yeah. It doesn't say we just like some money, please. But, okay. <laughs> mm. Well, there was that case of that that uh, young lad who um, who tragically died from uh, some illness a couple of years ago, and in his will he left some money to the Ubuntu Foundation. Okay. Really? And the problem is, it's actually quite problematic for us to be able to figure out how to use that money in the foundation and get the money out of the foundation. So it's easier. Right. To give the money to Canonical and then Canonical curate what happens with that money based on the sliders and, you know, how much okay. people I like, I like the idea of the sliders, being able to say, I want to support whatever it might be, uh, Zubuntu, yeah. Lubuntu. It doesn't work quite in the same way as the Humble Bundle, though. With the Humble Bundle, okay. you put your total amount in and then the sliders just tell you the proportion that you're going to give to each each thing. Whereas right. this is you slide them up to give more money and then it, then it counts. Oh, I see. Totally oh, okay. Yeah. So, right. yeah, with the Humble Bundle, you choose yeah. an amount first and then, and you, then determine. you divide it, right. But with this, you, you choose how much by sliding the various things. And then at the end, it totals up how much you've decided to give mm-hmm. and finds some uh, comedic thing that it's worth the same <laughs> oh, yeah. as. Uh, yeah. uh, as, you, as you sort of adjust the amount, it gives you a sort of an equivalent. So a pint of beer or a T-shirt or um, a a, a camel. Pair, a camel. But the yes. thing is, that is that is a, like a conversation that I will have, like, for example, recently with my wife, um, we were talking about um, buying something for the kids, and we worked out how much it was. It was like four bottles of wine. Mm. And that's how, you know, it was it was related, was it's <laughs> the same as, you know, a quiet, quantity a, of alcohol. A quiet night in for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, should we say pleased? Does she listen? No. 
almost certainly not. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I'm sure that there'll be lots of people shouting about this because, you know, they'll shout about anything. Well, but we want their first. <laughs> it's always been tricky whenever we talk about money relating to Ubuntu. Mm. Yeah. And part of that trickiness is everyone knows that this was originally bankrolled by Mark. Yeah. And with his, you know, magic box of shiny coins. And that, <laughs> that's the elephant in the room is the fact that there's a guy there who's given a boatload of money to the creation of this thing. Yeah. And some people resent the idea of, oh, why should I give him my money? He's clearly got loads. Well, the fact is he's given loads of it to yes. creating this thing. So and, it's not unreasonable that we, other people's that, salaries that we need like some that. money, yeah. not, not to give back to Mark, but we need some money to continue the process. Yes, it's, I think. Yes, you can't rely on one person's benevolence forever. No. no. It's all very British, isn't it? <laughs> Is it? Not wanting to talk about money. Oh, well, yeah. no, we get it all the way around, all around the world. The locos all around the world have real difficulty whenever yeah. they're dealing with money. Although some don't. You know, France and Germany, they seem to get on with it just yeah. fine. Yeah. Uh, well, it's the continental attitude. It's the continental way. Cool. What's in the not about Ubuntu this time, Laura? Oh, I don't know. Right. I'm still looking There's at a video the blog post. on YouTube. Yes. yes. Go video and watch it. Of you yeah. on YouTube. It's, Is it good? It's, Me? It's, um, it's about Oldcamp. It's an yes. Old Camp it's, it's interactive a, documentary. It's really cool. I know it, I was in the trailer. Yeah. And you're, you know, I think the trailer is basically the little intro to the uh-huh. the thing as a whole. But yeah, it's got a little bit with um, with Dan sort of chatting about Odd Camp and mm. how it all came together. And then the rest is basically just interviews with people from the community. Yeah. And like people who were running sessions and just and people who were there hacking on stuff. It's interactive. It's like one of those make your own adventure books. Yeah. yeah. So you to page get, 12. You mm. get, you get sort of like a, a clip with... Um, <laughs> Does Sorry. it happen in YouTube videos? I don't think so. You, you get know. like a, a, a clip where someone starts talking about what they've been doing and then they get to the end of their bit and it will say you can go see the full interview with them or you can carry on with this video. And so you can sort of make your oh, own nice. documentary depending on what you're interested in. That's sweet. Cool. So we'll put a link to that in the show notes mm-hmm. and you can check it out. And that was all made by a member of the community with no involvement from us. Yes. Which was quite nice. Yes, a friend of Dan's, I think. Yes, yes. Was or it? one of the Open Labs people, something like that. I was like going to say, was it not Chris from Open Labs? Yes, yes. possibly. But who is also a friend of Dan's? Yes. Yes. There we go. Excellent. Check that out. Time for your feedback. And Adam left a comment on the website to point out. <laughs> <laughs> Gulp. Sorry. Now tea. is not the time to drink tea. He talked faster. Um, would, what would be interesting would be to see if a new bit to Ubuntu and Linux typed in Adobe Photoshop in the lens and then brought, uh, bought it through Amazon to discover that it wouldn't run natively on Ubuntu. Is that a good idea? Do you really want to promote Windows software on a different platform? And ultimately, it could be perceived as an alternative software centre to the Ubuntu software centre. Actually, we had a bug filed because originally in the... Sh- this is talking about the shopping lens in 1210. Yeah. yeah. In the shopping lens, originally, when you type uh, something in, it would return Android apps from mm. the Amazon Android store, <laughs> yeah. which you can't run on Ubuntu. Yeah. So I think there's been some filtering done so that, that doesn't happen anymore. Okay. Yeah. So, so it, it shouldn't let you... There, um, find Photoshop and other Windows apps. There are all sorts of filtering going on there now that there wasn't isn't. originally. Correct, yes. <laughs> I see. Less said about that, the better, perhaps. Yes. Mm-hmm. Nigel Verity thought it would be interesting to ponder what would happen if Linux really did take off in a big way. Certainly we could start to see Linux viruses, so antivirus software would become essential and slow all our computers down. The big proprietary software companies would not go away. They'd start writing non-free software for Linux. Non-technical users would simply buy computers with Linux pre-installed and would be sold proprietary applications to go with them. Linux is not simply another operating system. Behind Windows and Mac OS, uh, there are just email addresses and premium rate phone numbers. Behind Linux, there are real people who often go to great lengths to help each other out on technical issues. If commercial interests look too prominent a role in Linux, much of that community would surely fade away. It may not be a popular view, but I feel that desktop Linux needs to remain niche, or perhaps it's more that there is a demand for a niche operating system with a community ethos. If it grows to a point where it becomes overwhelmed by community interests, then maybe the ultimate accolade for the open source concept will be that Linux itself will be forked. It's an interesting point, and yes, I can see yeah. some of that happening. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, although I'm certainly not sure that he's right that behind Mac OS there's just email addresses and premium rate phone numbers. I'm pretty there's sure there's people in the bar. shops. Yeah. Yes. yes. Yes, they have all those shops things, don't they? <laughs> 
Hmm, interesting point. I'm sure I have an email address. I'm not sure I have a premium phone number, though. <laughs> <laughs> You've got loads in your phone. I saw the other day. <laughs> Laura, save me. Jason left a comment on our website. Having the adverts in your main searches is like having CCTV in your living room. We all go outside in the world and drive our cars under constant CCTV, but you expect it when you go outside and it doesn't bother you. It's actually reassuring. I don't mind the suggestions and adverts, but put them somewhere where I expect them, like a separate lens with a separate search or in the software centre. I like what Unity is trying to do. However, it is so bloated, I feel it gets in the way. Known Classic is dead, may it rest in peace, but don't give me reasons to mourn for it. Bring back that fresh nimbleness that Ubuntu was known for. That I found that quite a scary analogy you made there. What about CCTV? The idea mm. that you expect it when you go outside and that it doesn't bother you, and that it's reassuring. It's only been, what, 10 years since we've been having CCTV everywhere, and that's normal. Well. Hmm. That's really quite a... Yeah. And does he also find adverts on the web reassuring? Yeah, that was your extension yeah. of the analogy, wasn't it? Maybe I'm, maybe I'm reading too much into this. <laughs> There's a sort of time and a place argument, ignoring the, uh, the analogy. There's a sort of time and a place argument. You'd perhaps expect to see web adverts in the context of a web page. Of a web page, yes. Yeah. Um, yes. And, because, and it's clear that they are an advert. Yeah. Whereas Only because it's evolved that way. It's, I agree. It, it, on day one of the web, when you know bloke set up his GeoCities site, it wasn't riddled with adverts on day one. They came later when people realised, oh god, we've got to pay for this somehow. Yeah. yeah. You know. So. <laughs> so some a, parallels. A, a bunch there. Of, <laughs> <laughs> Ubuntu is the GeoCities of the uh, Linux I'm, desktop world. I'm not world. sure that analogy went as well as I thought it might. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Bob left a rant on our website. You can have all the choice you want, but most people want commercial applications, and Linux doesn't run any commercial products like Adobe products, for example, but OS X and Win Windows do run open source software. So why would I buy a laptop with Ubuntu on it if I need Adobe Lightroom and Adobe support and resources? Your platform of choice is determined by the applications you run, and Canonical, Red Hat, etc. haven't figured that out yet. They're still trying to get their user interfaces figured out. Well, arguably, so are Microsoft given they've changed their user interface dramatically in Windows 8. Yeah. So they haven't got their UI figured out quite right. Um, I, and I don't, I don't agree that Photoshop and Lightroom are the be-all, end-all of uh, adoption of the Linux desktop by mm. any stretch. What do you use, Tani, as a professional photographer in the room? Um, I use a program called Aftershot Pro, oh, which yeah. is by Coral. Proving Nigel Verity right. <laughs> Yeah, it's proprietary software. Yeah, isn't it? which is proprietary, pro yeah. uh, proprietary software. But yeah. you know, it's yeah. not. It's just not that proprietary software that lots of people have heard of and a lot of people use. Indeed, yeah. it's so another piece of proprietary software. You may then ask the question: What would I use if Adobe products were available on Ubuntu? And I don't Tony, know. The what answer. would you use if Adobe products were available on the Ubuntu platform? I don't know, but it would be a, a different decision. <laughs> well, yeah, but well, was uh, he actually says commercial products, not proprietary products? So, I mean, okay. I think he means you commercial think he means proprietary. proprietary. He means Adobe, basically. He gives ex explicit examples of Adobe Lightroom. And, yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, these are insanely popular pieces of software for a certain audience. But there is yeah, a, a certain giant audience, not most people. boatload of people out there who have never used Lightroom, yeah. who have never, ever used Photoshop in their lives. Who are generally, hopefully, well served by Shopwell and FSpot and the like. Yeah. I'd hope so. Or, yeah, <laughs> or don't need anything to do with photos at all. And, yes. And a point that Mark made earlier, there's, there is a, a certain uh, set of people who, even if they, even if we did have Photoshop and Lightroom on Linux, they would just pirate it anyway. Mm. They yes. would just go and get a hooky copy. So what benefit does it have for Adobe to port that stuff over? Yeah. If all that's going to happen is the people who just get the, the people who would buy it don't buy it, they just pirate it. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Mm. Jay replied to make the point. No one's forcing you to use Linux if you need to use some overpriced proprietary app, but 99% of us haven't got any need for them at all. Oh, excellent. That's what I just said. <laughs> and Bob replied. 99% of us don't have any need for lenses or user interface tweaks. <laughs> just to show that we have a balanced view of okay. the world. So that's 99% of people and another 99% so, so of people. 98% of people. Also, don't need well, it, no, right? no, there, there's some crossover there. So 0.01% zero <laughs> really? zero, zero zero like of people both need lenses and proprietary <laughs> applications, <laughs> we have decided. Therefore, there's no point pointing it. There Absolutely. will be an interesting study into how 
how many people think that they are in the majority? Yes, I think ninety nine percent of people think, think like they're in the majority. <laughs> yeah, think their needs are the needs of everyone. Yes, indeed. Um, Stephen from the <laughs> Ohio Loco left us this voicemail. Whoa, are we starting a desktop environment holy war? I mean, granted, yes, CDE was my first experience with X11 back when I used Solaris on a government surplus spark box that I owned. Granted, yes, nowadays I use XFCE on my machine. Mom and Dad use LXDE because, frankly, we don't have a single computer that is built enough to handle Unity 3D and Unity 2D is deprecated. So why are we going down that road? Really? Unity 3D is nice if you have the hardware to support it. I'm not made of gold. And if I could afford the hardware to support that, a MacBook would be in the running. Right, if I, if I was made of gold, I wouldn't be working for Canonical. <laughs> <laughs> what would you be doing? Would you be uh, flying in space? I don't know. Not much, really. Quite heavy. Yeah. yeah. On the back of a forklift. <laughs> <laughs> Usual day for me, then. <laughs> Before anyone else gets. That's the end of your feedback. That's all for this episode. Thank you so much for listening. You can find out how to get in touch with us via our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org, where you can find our voicemail numbers and Twitter feed, Facebook and renewed Google Plus page and IRC <laughs> channel. What happened to the Google Plus pages? We lost it. Uh, someone, us... someone deleted it. Yes, me. Uh, <laughs> let's... <laughs> Shh. Uh, can you edit this bit out? Uh, let us know what you think of the show and give us your thoughts about Ubuntu and the community that makes it. Join us on Tuesday, the 23rd of October, for our next live broadcast, which I won't be on. Oh, oh thank God. Uh, what? what? Sorry. <laughs> Hello. Are you skiving? Yes. I will be okay. skiving in uh, Copenhagen, Duh. the Ubuntu Developer Summit. Excellent. Oh, Ooh. so you can come back and tell us stuff. Maybe. Yep. The stuff that's publicly available. <laughs> Cool. There's going to be some exciting stuff coming up at UDS. Excellent. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, you might like to know that Jonar, in our IRC channel, has just donated some money to Canonical awesome. um, for making Ubuntu. Brilliant. Wow. What Yay. just did he put it towards? Uh, I, he didn't say, but he did say he donated more, some money and didn't need, even download the CD. We need more <laughs> Amy Ferguson's, that's what it is. Oh, yes. More of those. <laughs> right. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.